We believe that God has been speaking to this house specifically on prayer. We live in an hour right now where we need to pray. The series that we're involved with right now is pray first and pray what? Pray first and pray often. Guys, we must never, ever forget that. You know, there's been times in the world of Christianity that perhaps, and, and I'm just not going to speak for anybody else, I know for us, you know, there's times I used to read the Word and try to find the next best message. How can I present this in such a way? Yes, present truth, but you know, when the longer you walk this out, the more you begin to understand this has really nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with Him and His kingdom. See, His goodness is so very important to us, Amen. When you walk this out longer than just a minute, right? Some of you have been doing this for a few minutes. God is so faithful. And you begin to recognize some of his attributes, some of his characteristics, and not the least of which is his goodness. He's a good, good father that loved you and I so much that he chose to send his only begotten son, Jesus. That's why we lift that name, the name that is above every name. There is no name under the heavens whereby men must be saved. It's only at the name of Jesus that every knee will bow on the earth, in the heavens, below the earth, friend. We exalt the name of Jesus for a reason. But never forget, God our Father, Jehovah, he is three in one. God knew that there needed to be a perfect and sinless sacrifice, which is the reason he came in the flesh, took on humanity, lived, although he was tempted in every manner in which we have been tempted, he lived without sin. Praise God for that. And he chose to die for you, and he chose to die for me, and I'm so thankful for that. So I'll never apologize for lifting up the name of Jesus, but understand that we read of God the Father, God His Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit, that if you chose to believe in Him, if you make a decision for Christ, the Holy Spirit, God Himself, chooses to come and live on the inside of you and I. That's what the Word teaches. How about that? God on the inside of us. Let me pray real quick. Father, thank You for a new day. Thank you for this message that you've put in my heart. Thank you that you are such a good, good Father. I'm overwhelmed this morning at your goodness, your mercy that you have bestowed in my life and the life of many of those that are in this room, those that care to take a hard look at where they once were and where you've brought them from. We thank you this morning for your mercy. We thank you for the love, your patience. You've you've endured with us. You pursued us when we weren't pursuing you. You died for us when we were yet a sinner. You chose to cleanse us by the purifying work of the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you this morning that we stand today empowered by the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. We thank you, Father God, that you have given us the Holy Spirit to empower us to go forth in a darkened world and shine forth our light, that people around about us would see what we're doing and they might praise you in heaven. Lord, may, us be, may we be quick to give you the praise and the glory and the honor because you alone are worthy of that in Jesus' name. Today we don't have a PowerPoint, so we're going back old school, right? So I want you to make sure if you, if you have you know, pen and paper, get it out. If you want to take notes, today's not going to be the day that you're going to be able to snap a shot at the screen behind me. And you say, well, what happened? Well, I don't really know. I sat down with every intention to get that done, but I can tell you this morning what happened. As I started reading in the Word of God, about an hour and a half went by, and I realized I had just about read 1 Kings all the way through. I was, I am, I am meditating upon specific aspects of who God is. I believe it's okay to do that. Sometimes there's a revelation of his mercy that I will receive, and I want to, I want to really dive in and think about how merciful he has been to me. Other times when I am 
going through things and I'm overwhelmed and, and I need that father in my life. I, I want to sit in his presence and just allow my father. Listen, I know this is foreign language for some of us in this room. Perhaps we didn't have the father that was tender and loving. So we serve a God that, yes, he's authority. He's powerful. He is, I mean, he's the head honcho. He is God almighty. But friends, let me tell you something. He will come to you and love on you like nobody else. He'll encourage you and strengthen you in days of weakness. When you seem that you can't go another day, I'm telling you, if you will stop, somebody say stop. If you will stop long enough to sit in his presence, open up his word. This is not just, you know, black and white words or red, you know, words on a page. This is Jesus, the son, from start to finish, written, given unto us. And when you read this, it's alive. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that the Word of God is living and it is active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It'll divide those things between, you know, joint and marrow, soul and spirit. It'll lay bare and uncover every thought that you might have, every attitude of your heart, and you'll walk away with a revelation. You know what? I'll one day stand before this loving Father. And friends, if you've read the Word like I have, He's going to look at you and he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I had a real visual of that this week as I was just driving down the road. And most of you know, I lost my mother three months ago. And I just, um, it was another one, of, <clears throat> excuse me, another one of those moments I wanted to pick up the phone. And I just wanted to talk to her. And it's, those that have gone through this know this is a reality. You just, you know she's not here. I know she's not gone. I know where she's at, praise God. But you just have this human side of you that just wants to pick up the phone and talk to her. For me, I grew up single mom home. She's my rock. Not perfect, but man, there's no love like a mother's love, Amen. And so I begin to get this, I begin to just think about her. And I begin to think about how happy she was to see the very one that she longed to see. And friends, as much as she loved her mom and her dad and those of her friends that have gone on before her, as much as that love was a part of who she was, her, her dying response was not, I want to die to go see my mom or die and go see my dad. I want to die and go see Jesus that paid a price that I might live for eternity. I'm going to need some Kleenex from somebody down there, please. Sorry about that. Um, friends, let me tell you something else. You spend a little time with the Lord, tears that have been bottled up inside of you for years will begin to come forth, and they need to. It's healing. It's healing. Yes. See, I believe that we are living in an hour that we're going to need to go past the surface. We're going to need to go past what we learned in vacation Bible school. As great as that is, as simple as that is, and as powerful as it is to understand our salvation, nothing greater. But friends, we live in a very complex world, and who God made, if you haven't studied out who we are physically, our anatomy, how our brain, you know, is wired. I'm certainly not the smartest man in the room when it comes to any of this. But I'll tell you, it's beyond my comprehension how we just continue to keep on and keep on and keep on. And God has such a, a revelation of who he is. He desires to give to us, but we're so wound up in this world, we can't stop long enough to experience him in the here and now because we will experience him for eternity in the there and then. I wrote down here today part five of praying first and praying what? is we need to pray prayers that are effective prayers. Effective prayers. I don't want to pray just a miss. I don't want to pray I hope so prayers. I want to have faith because I know who he is. I want to pray with such a determination that the prayers that I'm lifting up are going to be effective. They're going to, they're going to hit the mark. And in order for you and I to do that, we're going to have something beyond just the bumper sticker Christianity. We're going to need to know him. 
and he's available for us to know. Let me get to my notes so I don't get too far off. 1 Peter chapter 4 this morning, beginning in verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. Friends, when I say this first line, this would be probably a good place to have a revelation. I don't necessarily need an amen, but you need to understand that what I'm getting ready to say is absolute truth. Verse 7 says, the end of all things is near. Now, I get it. For those of us, we're in the Bible Belt. For many of us in this room, we've heard this since we were yay high, that, hey, Jesus is coming back soon. And when he comes back, you know, he's coming back for his bride, a, a pure and spotless bride, made pure and spotless only by the blood of Jesus. But friends, I'm telling you, we're closer now than we've ever been before. And today we need to be ready. Therefore, the end of all things is near. Excuse me, therefore, because the end of all things is near, be clear-minded and self-controlled. Now, let's just stop on clear-minded just for a moment. It's because we are bombarded with so many thoughts and opinions. We're bombarded by the marketing world, the visuals of our day. The sound is, is deafening the, with the world around us, which is why you have to have self-control to cut it off. You've got to be disciplined to cut off the noises, whether that's social media in your world, radio talk show host, or TV programs, your own voice in your head that's, that's beckoning you to go make more, be more, do more. Be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can what? What does it say in your Bible? So that you can pray. Friends, we must not just pray first and pray often because it's a good slogan. It's got to be because it is our lifeline. Prayer is simply talking with God in a lot of different ways. I call upon the name of the Lord it speaks of in the Old Testament. I seek his face, all of which is prayer coming to our God through Jesus Christ and having the ability to have a conversation, which is not just he talking to us or us talking to him. It's a dialogue. He will talk with you, and we get to talk with him. And it's a beautiful relationship, which is why we say it's not religion. It's relationship. The call that I've been making unto us is not just to give us knowledge that we need to pray. It's a, it's a genuine throwing out of a lifeline in the darkest of days that we are, are in and are yet to come. And if we're not prepared, then it's going to be a tough, tough day for you. And you say, well, I'm a child of the Most High God. Yeah, go, go tell these that, that were thrown into the Colosseum. Go tell those that lost their life through martyrdom. Tell those that are alive today that are under persecution and attack. Those that are hungry, not well-fed, not air-conditioned. Don't have the ability just to go see a doctor if need be. Friends, let me tell you, there are people out there outside of the comforts of our world. We call those first world problems here in America. There's people that are genuinely hungry and thirsty And they're in deep need. But friends, make no mistake, they have the same need that you and I do, and it starts with love. And if we'll pray, God will answer. So I have written here, part five, effective prayers that God will answer. And if y'all give me the liberty this morning, we're going to read several portions of Scripture, and we're going to start in Psalms 116. Psalms 116, y'all know that I'm reading through the Psalms right now. It's not the only thing I'm reading. I just told you I read half the book of 1 Kings this morning. Totally got lost in time. Almost didn't make it. Thank you, Calvary, for coming home. I had already had the awakening that, hey, I better better get dressed here. We got church this morning. I was just enjoying my time with the Lord. It says right out of the gate in Psalms 116, I'm reading from the NIV version. For some of you, that's the nearly inspired version, but it'll be okay. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. Now, before we just jump past and want to read the next and and check our checkbox that we've read Psalm 116, stop for just a second. This is what I mean when I say stop. Slow down. 
I love the Lord. Now make it personal. Do you love the Lord? And if so, why so? Here, the psalmist writes, I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He has a revelation that God Almighty has heard his prayers. He's not just offering them up into space hoping that somebody in the distant future is going to hear this. No, this individual that wrote this, many believe, many theologians believe this is King David. There's some other people that believe others, but listen, whomever it might be, this individual has a revelation that I love the Lord because I know he hears my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Have you ever offered a cry for mercy? You know, the Bible tells us that we can boldly approach the throne room of grace and seek mercy in time of need. Anybody here ever been in a time of need? You have the authority to boldly come into the throne room of grace, the king of all kings, and you can go before knowing that Jesus himself sits at the right hand of his Father in constant intercession for you and I. What a great relief and what a great joy. He says, because he turned his ear to me, because this individual has this revelation that I've cried out to him for mercy, he heard my voice, because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. There's no, well, if this don't work out, I'm just going to go do this, that, or the other. There's no other options. I mean, we got to burn the ships at the port. We're out there on on, on, on waters that it's going to take some faith. But when you begin to know that you know that you know that Jesus is real and that my Father has heard my cry and he has answered me, I don't want to turn away and do anything else. Where am I going to go? You know, Jesus looked at his disciples one day. Everybody was just turning and leaving him. He looks at him and says, what about you guys? What you going to do? Thank God for old Peter. Where are we going to go? You have the words to eternal life. We're following after you. The cords of death entangled me. Verse 3, the anguish of the grave came upon me. Have you or do you know anyone that could say, I can, re, I, can, I can absolutely identify with what's going on here. The cords of death entangled me. Anybody been there? I know I was the night of my cocaine overdose. I was on the floor and I knew that I was not going to make it to see the next morning but God. The revelation of the anguish of the grave has come upon me. I was overcome by trouble. I was overcome by sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the simple hearted. When I was in great need, he saved me. Be at rest once more, oh my soul. Friends, anybody need some rest? Anybody been battling that little voice in your head? Anybody been battling the little face in the mirror? Or those that you see throughout your day? Be at rest. Your mind, your thoughts, your emotions, happy, glad, sad, mad. You need to get a handle on your emotions. You need to get a handle on your thoughts. You need to get a handle on your decision making. Then you need your soul to be at rest. And there's a promise. Be at rest once more, O my soul, for the Lord has been good to you, the goodness of our God. For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. Go back to verse 8. For you, I wish it said for you alone because I know that would be true. For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears. There's been a deliverance that has taken place, my feet from stumbling, that I might walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed. Therefore, I said, I am greatly afflicted. And in my dismay, I said, all men are liars. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? Can you stop for a second? Close your eyes in this room just for a moment. Can you think about the goodness of our God?
He starts off that psalm, I love you, Lord. I love the Lord. I love you, Lord. For your mercies never fail me. All my days have been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I have seen. In all my life you have been faithful. In all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God. You know, I thought my mom, she loved to sing, but by her own admission, she could not. But I thought she just joined the band of angels singing around the throne. And friends, she's singing today and loving every moment of it. I'm going to stop right there on verse 12, repeating again, how can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? Now, these are surface items. Now, before I just say that and leave. Let me, let, me, let me give it a caveat. Surface in the understanding that at some point, listen to me, church, I'm going to speak out of a, what I have witnessed. Can I put it that way? Many, many people come unto the Lord. And many, many of those same people, when things get tough or things get hard or the attacks come, you look around and they're nowhere to be found. And I'm like, what, what happened? See, we have, listen to me, cover your toes, ladies that got you know, open, show, open toes this morning because I'm about to, about to get on them. Whole front row just went by. <laughs> we have fed from right here, especially in America, we have fed such a surface-level gospel that is so centered around, it's all about me. We sing songs on how God's going to bless me and me and me and mine. That somehow we've got this notion that God's up there just, I got to bless them or, or they're going to be offended with me. Friends, listen to me. I'm going to say this, and this may not be the the most theological way to say it, but I'm going to say it in South Alabama ways that I know how it might be understood. This ain't about you. Now, it has everything to do with you as being a sinner that needs to be redeemed by the grace that God affords to us in the shedding of his blood. And that is powerful. And friends, you can't add to what Jesus did at the cross. But let me tell you something. We live in an hour and in a day that if the church, and that includes the church of America, because I want to tell you something, the church is rising around the world. It might be a remnant following, but the church, the church, the bride of Christ that has washed their robes in the purifying blood of Jesus, there's a church that's arising. It's his bride. He's coming back for a spotless bride. But friends, I want to tell you, we better start opening up our eyes to who God has always been because the Bible tells me in the new covenant that he's the same yesterday as he is today and he'll be the same forevermore. So we can't just take this whole Old Testament, rip it out, throw away the prophets, throw away Israel, replace Israel with ourselves and somehow think that we're going to be a part of the cutting edge frontline ministry that God wants to do in these last days. Does God want to feed the poor? Absolutely. Thank God for our youth that went and did some of that yesterday. Praise the Lord. Does God want us going on a missions trip? Sure, if there's a mission to be had. 
Does God want us to witness to our family and our neighbors? Absolutely. But let me tell you something. We better get our eyes off of what's happening on Fox News and get our eyes on what's happening around the world because he's coming back for his people, of which you and I as Gentile believers have been grafted into this thing. But never forget who the root is. It's Israel. And if we don't understand why we must pray for, support, and stand by Israel and the consequences of not, then, friends, we're going to find our nation in very desperate times of which those that are calling upon the name of the Lord will find themselves being martyred for their faith if they choose to stand. Why are you bringing that up, Pastor Jason? Because I don't know how much time we have left. And if we're going to pray, it can't be the prayers that we were taught. God, just help me and mine. Let us get through another day. Help me pay my bills. Even though you told me not to spend more than what I was making, I did it anyway. Now help me pay it. Don't let that get on anybody's toes. Lord, just, 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 just do for me. Let, let me be prosperous and successful so that I can have a bigger house. And I can eat steak when I want to. And I can go on vacations to the beach or the mountains or Disney World or whatever else I, I, I want to do. Now, I'm talking to us about the goodness of God. So let's take a look at the goodness of our God with a smile on our face. Because we got to remember who he is. And if he's nothing more than, than, you know, what I'm getting ready to say, which he's everything, I want you to focus on this one today. He's good. So turn with me to James chapter 5. You say, how long are we going to be here? Until we're done. James chapter 5. To give it some context, I'm going to back it up to verse 13. Is any one of you in trouble? He should what? You sure? Don't go down to the bank account and get some more money and solve that problem? You know, my dad used to tell me, son, you ain't got a problem until you can't write a check for it. Then you got a problem. Is any one of you happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call, he, that person that's sick, should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer that's offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man, somebody say a righteous man, is powerful and it's effective. It's powerful and it's effective. What do we know about Elijah and the prayers that he offered? We know that he shut the heavens up of rain for three and a half years because he said it wasn't going to rain. And it didn't open up until God told him it was time to pray that it would open up. Friends, do you think somehow in this New Testament world that we live in, we don't possess the power of Almighty God living and residing on the inside of us? We're praying petty prayers for the most part that have to do with just me having a little bit more and, and, and me being a little bit better. And me not, not you know, Lord, don't, don't let me fall under judgment. I know I sinned again and again and again. And yet, my God in heaven's just going to blow it away because he's a sugar daddy, right? Mm-mm, he's God Almighty. And we've got to start with a reverence. See, I'm leading us somewhere. Because I know what God is wanting to say in these last days. Because I do know, because I've read the back of the book as well. I know that there's coming an hour and a day that you're not going to like. I wish I could sugarcoat that for you. I cannot, because this did not. There's coming a day that we must be ready and prepared. Lord, my dad used to say to me, son, it's good training. I'd say, what's good training? He said, all of it's good training. That was none more true until I got to the Marine Corps. And everything we did was good training. I had no idea why we did some of the training we did. 
some of my fellow Marines in the room, you'll remember this, and maybe this happened throughout other uh, uh, branches of service. I'm sure it did because everybody's goal was the same, have a prepared soldier that can go into battle and do some business. But I'll never forget, they gave us a boot brush. For those that don't know what a boot brush is, because we don't have laces or leather anymore. That's to shine up your shoes. It's about that big, got little horse hairs on it. It's not conducive for sweeping a 4,000 square foot barracks. And for the love of God, why Staff Sergeant Rutan thought it was a good idea for us to get squatted down. And if I do this, Calvary's going to laugh because he'll take him right back to Las Vegas when I tried to do one little lunge and all of a sudden, whoa! I mean, somebody just ripped my whole, never mind. So I go down like this and we're like this. And I'm taking that brush along with 72 others that we started with, of which we graduated 40. 72 ladies, as they called us, no offense, ladies. They called us ladies until the day we graduated boot camp. But 72 of us ladies got down there and we pulled our skirts up and we, we, we started brushing. We started brushing that dust day and night, night and day. Why, you might say? Because they knew that in about three short weeks, I'm going to find myself on the rifle range, and they're going to put me in positions and make me hold that position for, I mean, literally hours on end in some cases. And if you did not prepare the muscle group that we needed to prepare, then our muscles would begin to begin to shake, which makes a rifle begin to do that. Delaney, wherever she is, somewhere, there you are. You know how it is when that, when that shotgun's going like that. A shotgun, you got a pretty good shot as long as you got a big enough spread and not too far of a shot. But when you're firing 500 yards, or more importantly, 148, you better be prepared to have that rifle sitting in a position to where you can fire off what you need to. What's the point in bringing that up? We need to challenge. We need, I invite you to be a people that says, I want to be equipped with the knowledge to be effective in the last days. Not just, hey, I want to get ahead and be better, live a little bit and die. What is God calling us to do? You remember last week when I began to, you know, ask us, begin to talk to us about the fact that God has a purpose for your life, not just mine. Not just for you to come sit, and if you don't like it, to go to another, and if you don't like it, just to bail out when you want to bail out. How are you going to bail out? This is a kingdom. We have a king that's given orders. And while he loves us, and while he will bring us in, he's not as interested after we come to him. He expects us to get out of diapers and begin to grow up and get off of milk and begin to eat some meat. And I believe that in this house, we need to begin to move from milk to meat, from just being a motivational speaker and encouraging you and challenging you to do this, that, or the other. I need for us together to begin to say, you know what, I'm in it to win it. We're saying amen. I love it. 72 people signed the dotted line and said amen too. I want to be a United States Marine. Tristan and others in this room that have ser served in the United States military. Some of you that went on to special forces, you understand. You don't just, hey, I think I'd be, uh, can I be one of them snipers? Y'all, y'all would have got a kick out of me on the bus at Paris Island. I mean, I was happy-go-lucky, knew nothing about nothing. We're all a bunch of Alabama boys going down to Montgomery. Anybody ever stayed at the Capitol Inn? Nevertheless, they haven't tore it down now. We get on that bus and we land and that drill instructor comes on board that, that bus before we've ever stepped on foot on those yellow footprints. He said, where are my ladies from Alabama? I mean, I might as well have been Gomer Powell. Right here, sir. That's what I said. That's what your pastor said. <laughs> I thought, you know, later on when I saw that again in Gomer Pyle, I was like, God, that was me. <laughs> I bet everybody thought, you're an idiot. <laughs> I 
Elijah was a man like us, verse 17. It's important that we understand that. Yes, he was a prophet. Elijah was a man like us. He prayed earnestly. Now, we get into earnestly right here. We're going to start looking at things like travail. Well, I prayed. God didn't answer. Well, did you travail? Did you you press in? Do you realize there's some resistance in the heavenly realms? Listen, I know God hears us. I get that. But I'm telling you, sometimes you've got to fight through some things to get to the answer. Yes. Is God somehow not big enough to answer on the first call? No, he's very big and he can do exactly what he wants to do. But I want to tell you, there is a place for earnest prayers. There's a place for travailing so that you might prevail in the answered prayer. He was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Now, let me give you a little tidbit of where we're going, and it won't be this week. When you see rain, it's an outpouring. I believe God is desiring to have a deluge of an outpouring of his presence. We've seen that before, many revivals that have gone before us, when people's hearts are revived, brought back to life, as it were. I believe God so loves the world that he's going to do his part in bringing us to a place of decision to say, yes, I'm a child of the Most High God, and I'm not just going to play around with this and and put the badge on even though I really haven't gone through anything. Some of y'all also know this. We'd go out as as Marines, and and I'm not trying to highlight the Marines, just the service that I was in. Whatever service or branch you're in, whatever team you've ever been a part of, it can all apply. It's all applicable. But we'd go out, especially when I was out in Oceanside, California, and you'd see people that were imposters. Because if you had on the right uniform, there's a decent chance that ladies like a man in uniform. But we could always sniff them out. There's a couple things that didn't look just right. There's a couple times, Lord, I'm going to meddle more than I need to, but here's the deal. When we'd go out, there was a fight that was going to happen. Tristan, am I saying the truth? We didn't try to. Right? It's the same in the army. I know it was. You're not trying to go out and look for a fight. That wasn't your intention. But everybody wants to say, well, I'm going to size that Marine up, see what I can do. Well, see, one thing about the Marines you didn't understand, if you fought one, you fought them all. There it is. I wonder if that could be our rallying cry. You fight one Christian, you fight all of them. That's right. Amen. You're going to come against my brother or sister in the Lord. I'm not on my watch. I'm going to stand with them. I'm going to fight with them. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty for pulling down strongholds, taking captive every thought that's trying to come in, every arrow that the enemy's coming in. You got a brother that's weak in faith? Well, what's designed to extinguish the fiery darts of the evil one? It's the shield of faith. I need to stand to be a shield for my brother. I need to encourage him how the shield works and why he needs to take up his word and begin to read because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. We got to begin to be skilled warriors, not just part of the fan club. He prayed as a man, shut up the heavens. Turn with me to 1 Kings. We'll have to pick this up a little bit later next week, but I'm going to spend a little time here. Lord Jesus, where's First Kings? It run off from me. Lord God, I can't even find First Kings. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Kim's like, hey, it's right there on page 500. No, I'm just kidding. So this morning, I'm reading 1 Kings, I'm going through, and it's funny, because you start getting after Solomon, and it all begins to get a little wacky. 
all these kings for both Israel and Judah, right? We understand there's a northern and a southern kingdom here. They've got their king, right? This all started way back when, when they felt the need, they being Israel, the children of God, felt they needed something besides God. We want a king. And we've gone through, we've gone through, you know, Saul, we've gone through David, we've gone now to Solomon. And then all of a sudden, we've got some issues because that now we start reading things like, and I'll just, you know, pick it up in uh, maybe verse, or chapter 14, verse 22. Judah did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and by the sins they committed, they stirred up his jealous anger more than their fathers had done. Verse 24, there were even male shrine prostitutes in the land. The people engaged in all the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. So they start, you know, saying, well, maybe God is okay with all this stuff. We'll do whatever pleasures us. Listen to me. I need you to look at me because I'm going to say some things that are hard, but you got to hear my heart because I believe it's the heart of God today. Why would we yoke ourselves up with the world and its ways? I know that so many want that rainbow to be a symbol of love. But friends, this is a symbol of covenant. God's indignation brought forth floodwaters upon the earth. And he made covenant way back in Genesis 9, I think it was, somewhere in there. That he'd never do it again. And now we want to take a symbol of God's mercy that I'll never do this again, and we're going to mask it behind homosexuality. If anybody in this room is, is struggling, let me, let, me, let me say some things to you. It's a spirit that you're dealing with. It's not of God. God created male and female. If you're figuring, trying to figure that out, just ask somebody to pull the britches down. I mean, it's a male or female. I don't know how else to say that. I want to tell my Democratic brothers and sisters... I can't define a woman. Well, drop your drawers. I'll tell you real quick. I'm not going to look down on the front row right now. Because I just stepped a little further than I was supposed to step. But the truth is, we're going to somehow now pervert all of this. And listen, I, I understand the struggle is real, whether you're dealing with heterosexual lust for the same sex, or rather for the opposite sex, or you're dealing with a homosexual spirit that's trying to come in and confuse your mind that you're somehow supposed to be a girl when you're really a boy or vice versa. See, this is the, we are in the day and the age where the battle is, is enraging. It's, it's, it's raging throughout our land, and the church, in many instances, not all, but in many instances, we're still concerned on whether or not we're insulated and we're protected and we got enough money in our bank account. And the least path, I mean, the, the, you know, the path of least resistance. Chapter 15, Abijah, king of Judah. He committed all the sins of his father had done, verse 3 of 1 Kings 15. He committed all the sins his father had done before him. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his forefather had been. And you say, wait a minute, what I know about David is he was a murderer and an adulterer. Yeah, but he was also a repenter. That should be good news. You want, to, you want to see the goodness of God again? You're like, wait, we just bailed on the goodness of God? No, that's all the goodness of God. In his mercy, David, when called on the carpet, was, was, was shown his own sin by Nathan the prophet. He, he recognized, this is me you're talking about. And in Psalm 52, I believe it is, we read of the, the repentive nature in the heart of David against God and God alone have I sinned and there was consequences to his sin 
God didn't just say, oh, boy, he just messed up. You know, he just saw that old naked girl and just messed up. You give him some grace, give him mercy. Okay, I got you. But there's a consequence to that. Anybody ever lived through that? Don't raise your hand. Listen to me. There's consequences to our actions. And if there's consequences to our actions and we serve a God that on the one hand is a just God of judgment, he's also a merciful father that says, if you'll come to me, confess your sins. I'm faithful and I'm just. I'll forgive you of your sins and, and good news, goodness of God, I'll cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Isn't that good? That's better than good. That's great. That's, I mean, that's, that's as good as it gets. And we go over to Asa, the king of Judah now. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and his father David had done. He expelled the male shrine prostitutes from the land and got rid of all the idols his fathers had made. He even uh, deposed his grandmother Micah from her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive Asherah pole. Asa cut the pole down and burned it in the Kindron Valley. Although he did not remove the high places, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. Friends, I'm asking for full devotion because when we did graduate on that, you know, that day there at Paris Island, 422 degrees, when we finally, and I had the privilege, the same hillbilly that said, here we are, I had, to, I had that pole, I was our platoon leader, I was our guide, and I held that pole. And as I marched down there and I put that pole in the ground, staking our claim that we finished what we started as a team, we graduated 40 of us. And I'm telling you, we were forced to be reckoned with. You know why? Because we had unity. We had common purpose. We had an allegiance and a loyalty, and we were fully committed. Christians. I may start calling you Christians. Don't, don't, don't wear it lightly. If you got the uniform on, it's because you were purchased with the blood of Jesus. You're not your own anymore. The Marine Corps helped us understand you're not your own anymore. You live for us now. Right, wrong, or indifferent, they knew how to get the best and the most out of each individual because war was coming. And we had to be prepared to not only protect ourselves, to protect our brothers that were fighting with us, but we had to be willing to protect this nation. And there's men and women of God all over this, this land and men and women that are not of God all over the world that are standing behind that flag. And friends, I'm telling you, we as Christians better get behind this one. Nadab, king of Israel, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, walking in the ways of his father and in his sin, which he had caused Israel to commit. <laughs> I mean, you can read through on and on. Ahab becomes king of Israel over here in chapter 16, verse 29 and 30. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria over Israel for 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those who came before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Naboth, but he also married Jezebel's daughter, of Ithbel, king of the Sidonians, uh, and began to serve Baal and worship him. Now, friends, if you don't think we're living in a land of idolatry, you're, you're sadly mistaken. We say one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty, right? That's great. I stand behind that. I fought for it. And I still will. Our nation is worth protecting. Our nation is worth fighting for. But it's not going to be the everyday people who are electing somebody in the White House that are going to win the war that's at hand. It's going to be the Christians that stand up and see the fight for what it is, and they are well equipped to do the job. Yeah. 
Let's get back to the goodness of God in a little bit of time I've got remaining. Verse, or chapter 17. Now Elijah, the prophet that we read about over there in James, chapter 5, he's a righteous man, but he was a man like you and I. He shut the heavens up through prayer, opened up the heavens through prayer. His, his prayers were powerful and they were effective prayers. Because I want to get to what was spoken of in the book of James, where we read so casually, but we don't understand what really took place. Not just at the event of when the heavens opened back up or when they closed up, but all the things that made Elijah who he was. More importantly, all the things that Elijah began to have revelation of Almighty God is with me, and the struggles that he himself fought with over time. It's going to help you and I to learn how to better equip ourselves for the fight that's at hand. Now, Elijah the Tishbite, verse 1, from Tishbe and Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now, friends, that's a bold statement. That's, that is equally as bold as Jesus asking Peter to step out of the boat and walk on water. It doesn't really seem possible. I know none of y'all have done this besides me, but I've literally taken a step in the water thinking maybe I can walk on water. Maybe God will put that solid footing under my foot in the natural. And my foot's gone through the water every time. You're going to tell me that you're going to tell the king of the land, it ain't going to rain, friend. It ain't going to rain for three and a half years because I say so. More importantly, the God I serve told me, and I'm telling you, and it ain't going to open back up so you can cry for it, you can whine for it, you can do whatever you got to do, but I'm telling you, it ain't going to rain again until God tells me to tell everybody it's going to rain again. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Notice that in verse 2. Then the word of who? The Lord. Not your prophet that's on your website. What's God saying to you? I'm not saying he can't speak through people today. He can but can I tell you that he's going to speak first and foremost by the Holy Spirit through his word to you? Don't, don't listen, don't misquote me on that. Well, he don't believe in prophecy. I believe in prophecy. I believe in prophets. I believe in prophetesses. I believe in apostles. All the above. The word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. Verse 4 of chapter 17, 1 Kings. Verse 4, you will drink from the brook. I have ordered the ravens to feed you. The word of the Lord was, go here. I've ordered the ravens, that's the birds of the air, to come and feed you. I'm sending you where there's water. Because this too is going to dry up eventually, right? There's no rain in the land. But right now, I'm sending you where there's water. I'm going to make sure that the ravens, the birds of the air, will provide for you what you need. Not what you want, but what you need. So here, here's what's powerful in verse 5. So he did what the Lord told him to do. He went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. Didn't say, well, I'm tired of this, what he's providing for me. This water's nasty. Maybe I can find it on my own. Maybe I can do it my way, a different way. God's asking you to do it his way. The first time and all the time. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Sometime later, verse 7, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Don't you love how God's speaking to him? Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow. He's used nature, now he's used an individual. The least of all, least of all the least of the least. I have chosen this widow. I've commanded her. I've commanded a widow in the place to supply you with food. Verse 10, so he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called unto her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I might have a drink? Verse 11, as she was going to get it, he called and he said, hey, also bring me a piece of bread. 
As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied now, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little bit of oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we might eat it and we might die. Now, friends, you may not think you've got what it takes to get the job done for God, but I'm telling you, this is a, this ain't, you're not going to Paris Island. You're not going to go down to some, you know, cemetery, I mean, seminary, I mean, cemetery and figure out how you're going to do this. Because all of those are not equal. Are they in the Word of God? Are they teaching you Jesus? Are they teaching you how to hear the voice of the Lord? Because if they're not teaching you that, then friends, I would tell you I'd probably find somewhere else to go. You've got what it takes. Why do I know that with 100% assurance and confidence? Because our, our God has told us that we have everything that we have need of. What do you have need of that God can't supply? Is his arm too short now that somehow he's forgot about you and he can't provide for you? Friends, I'm telling you, God Almighty, if there's nobody else in this room, and if I'm looking at you and you're the only person in this room and me and you are talking, there's enough of God to go around. And we're going to stop right there today because I want to pick this up next week and lead us through a couple of stories on how Elijah gets this revelation of who God is. Obviously, he's understood one principle. Listen to me closely because this is the principle I want you to leave with. He's understood the goodness of God. How and why does he understand the goodness of God? Because when God speaks and he answered and followed the voice of the Lord, he did what God asked him to do, regardless of how crazy it might sound. You're going to send what, Lord? A bird to feed me? fully submitted unto God. See, here's what I'm going to tell you today. It's going to take a level of devotion that maybe if the shoe fits, wear it because I'm having to put it on afresh. Maybe we haven't quite been as devoted as we say we've been. Maybe we hadn't been quite as bold as we think we've been. Maybe we haven't been as open to the voice of the Lord speaking to us and saying something that seems off the rails. But because we've tuned into the frequency of God by spending some time with Him, and not some time, spending time, quality time with Him, we've now dialed in the frequency of God's voice, and when He begins to speak, our only response is what? Yes, sir. I mean, it's the same thing he trained me with Pastor Kim. She says, jump, I say, how high? (laughs) Don't believe that. I say, yes, ma'am, that's right. (laughs) Y'all stand to your feet with me today. Listen to me. There was a great call of action during our worship time. And it was a spiritual call through the words that were being sung, through the praise and the worship that brought his presence into this room. I pray you felt it. Sometimes people have asked me, what do you pray for here? The men's group will know this because I've told them several times. You know what I pray for in this group? That God would have his way and that his presence would be felt by everyone that walks upon this campus. Because here's what I know. If God's here and you're open and you're seeking him, friends, you'll find him. He's not playing hide and seek with you. He wants you. He wants you. Look at me, church. He wants you. He loves you. What do you have need of today? It was asked earlier. What do you need to pray for? He's okay with you praying stuff for yourself. He's all right with that. Listen, I love when my kids ask me for things. But if they're 52 years old coming and saying, Daddy, I need something to eat. Well, friends, you better go to work and find out how to feed yourself. And what I'm saying to you and I today is we're on different levels in this room. I get that. Not naive to the fact that some of you have only been walking this out but a minute. Some of you have been walking this a long time. And I want to tell you, we need all of us in this last hour. We need the young and we need the old. We need the mature and we need the immature. We need a people that are hungry for God. 
So we're going to play a song, and here's the only prayer I'm asking you today. I want you to reflect on God's goodness, that he's already shown himself in your life. The enemy loves to show everything that he's good at doing, every bad thing that has happened or or is it happening now or will happen in the future. That's his job. But if you'll say, just a moment, take some time, and whatever we're singing here, focus on his goodness. Because if you can start there, then you can finish strong. Can I encourage you? Monday night, our young adults, that you don't want to miss Monday night. My dad and stepmother are coming in. Men, my dad's going to speak to you guys. Young ladies, my stepmother's going to speak to you. And you want to talk about lady wisdom. My stepmother's lady wisdom. And my father's been around the, the world many, many times. He's got some things to impart. Some of y'all are asking, how old I got to be to come to that thing? Just, just come on. Amen. Tuesday night, can I ask you to pray for something? Tuesday night, we're gathering as Victory Christian School out at Waterworld. Cooking some hot dogs or whatever before men's group. I'll be coming over here to men's group. Pray for our school. Some of you might need to consider, how can I give, as, as Rick said, an offering? And how can I sow into something? Maybe you're really burdened with this next generation that's coming by. Can I tell you that at our school, Victory Christian School, we're pouring into these children to be the warriors, not just pacifying them with a pacifier and, and, you know, in a Bible verse. Raising them up. Sow a seed. Well, I ain't got much. Put $5 in the offering plate and say, let's let that go to Victory Christian School and watch what God will do. It's about one more soul. Men, if you're in this room and you're available on Tuesday nights at 6.30, we meet right over here in the fellowship hall. And friends, we're raising up some warriors in that room. We've got mighty men. You want to find out who the eldership is in this room? Walk in there. You'll see some gray hairs that know some things about this because they've walked it. You ain't got to be intimidated when you walk in there. It is a place where I'm telling you people are coming in and you can lay your baggage at the door. We got to grow the men up in this house. Wednesday, there's something for everybody to include the children and the women get together. And Dr. Katz is with the men. Friends, I'm telling you, if you can't make Tuesday, make Wednesday. You say, man, why I got to come all the time? You don't. But if you want to be trained, we're going to do some training in this house. Amen. If you want to find out what God's up to in these last days, stick around. You're going to be equipped so that we can be ready for the soon return of our King. The goodness of God today is making His appeal to you. Would you trust me? Know something about me, God speaking. I'm good. I'm good all the time. And I love you. And I want to spend time with you.